this one for you who first said that if you don't think if you're if you do not remember the past, then you're condemned to repeat it. A multitude of events serves to validate this claim. Chief amongst those is the gender equality movement. Gender equality has been an issue for as long as written history, or even longer, and in recent memory, it's become a movement. Yet, statistics show time and time again that despite public opinion and passion, gaps and disparities aren't closing. From Silicon Valley to the nation's capital, efforts haven't really worked across America, and they haven't worked across the world. So let's frame this issue in a familiar environment. High school. Think about the phrase, that's gay. Now I want you to ask yourself, whenever you heard this, did you do or say something about it? If you did, kudos to you for breaking through some of the structures of society that have ruled us since the beginning of the civilized world. If you didn't, you were just complicit in one of the most prevalent microaggressions made against men. That mindset of labeling something as feminine or gay to constrict a peer's actions isn't a particularly new one. In fact, it's a hallmark of the patriarchy, which aggressively dictates the way we all act. Women being forced into domestic or submissive roles is another, re is another hallmark of the patriarchy, which also puts a similar pressure on men to be both dominant and aggressive. Gender equality movements have sprung up from the realization in women that they lack power and the desire to change that. The most common one we know about, all of us, is the suffrage movement, which resulted in women being able to vote. But the one I'm going to be talking about is third wave feminism, which happened three decades ago. It's a little known fact to my generation that there was a gender equality movement three decades ago and that it didn't work. Third wave feminists can be considered a prologue to the, to the narrative millennials are writing today, but it only advanced the thinking of its stakeholders, women. It was women who took power, women who entered the workforce in places where they hadn't been before, and women who broke through the structures that had grounded their mothers and grandmothers. But the noticeably missing demographic is men. Men weren't a part of the movement as stakeholders, and that proved to be the movement's fatal flaw. And it might also be the reason why our movement fails today. Because another reason why history might be condemned or repeated itself isn't because of the lack of knowledge, but rather the lack of change despite that knowledge. Now, I'm not going to be talking about, as I said before, men needing to be allies or even being feminists but through their female counterparts, but rather how they need to be stakeholders themselves. Because something that dictates them just as much as it dictates everyone else the patriarchy. I'm also going to be using another term in this talk, hegemonic masculinity, which is not to be confused with toxic masculinity. As per its name, toxic masculinity defines behavioral aspects of masculinity as toxic to the world. Hegemonic masculinity, on the other hand, says that the idea of masculinity is a stratified one. It's hierarchical. According to the Global Policy Journal, there's an ideal masculine male, which is the hegemonic masculinity. And from that, all men position themselves around it. And because of this, there's a hierarchy because some are closer than others. But there's a constant pressure to abide by the idea of what an ideal masculine male is. So I guess the question is, what is that? What is the ideal masculine male? And the issue is, there isn't a sure list of qualities that make someone the ideal male. And because of that, it's ultimately unattainable. There's a pressure to achieve something that is ultimately unachievable. And because of that, understanding hegemonic masculinity is extremely important to understanding the gender-based hierarchy and to how to make gender equality movements successful. Hegemonic masculinity has shown us that there's this pressure to conform and that the fear of ostracization is what results in the masculine person. Now, that fear and ostracization, as well as the pressure coupled with it, result in a multitude of issues, but I'm going to be talking about mental health and gender-based violence today. Hegemonic masculinity is the root of mental health issues in males. Amongst these are a lower diagnosis of depression and a higher suicide rate. According to the National Institute of Mental Health, men are three times as likely to commit suicide as women. And this is higher amongst Alaskan Natives, Native Americans, and white males. And this isn't just a national issue. Statistics also show that there's a trend amongst other countries, even highly developed ones, such as the United Kingdom. Yet there isn't enough attention on this issue to solve the underlying one, the conditioning of the patriarchy into us 
that creates behavioral standards. Men, as per the patriarchy, are supposed to be stoic or aggressive, and anything else is unacceptable. And there's a stigma with being vulnerable by doing things like coming in crime. And nothing epitomizes this more than the media. The media, in one breath, condemns toxic ideals of masculinity, and in the next, ridicules Justin Bieber when pictures of him surface of him crying. There's a gap in the two ideals, and that needs to be solved in gender equality movements. And another issue with mental health in men is alcoholism, which relates to the graph shown here. Alcoholism is a known risk factor for suicide. And as of statistics for March 2019, suicide is the biggest killer of males under the age of 45, with a three times higher rate. Women are caught earlier with mental health issues because the prerequisite to being healed is being vulnerable, and that's something that's seen as inherently feminine. But men aren't because of the fear and pressure to not be vulnerable. And I acknowledge, some people are brave enough to take that step and to, be, and to fend off the pressure and actually get help. But the sad truth is, not everyone is that brave. Another issue that can be traced back to hegemonic masculinity is gender-based violence. And these numbers are staggering for this issue. According to the World Health Organization, 35% of women have either been sexually assaulted or experienced physical violence from an intimate partner or sexual violence from a non-partner. And 38% of the murders of women are committed by an intimate partner. To put that first number in context, the world's population is about 7.8 billion, and the ratio of men to women is one to one, so basically half and half. That means there's 3.9 million people, a million women in the world, rather. 35% of that is 1.4 billion. That's 1.4 billion women who've experienced sexual or physical violence from an intimate partner or sexual violence from a non-partner. Furthermore, statistics have shown, and studies rather, have shown that a higher adherence to hegemonic ideals results in a greater attitude of sexual aggression or coercion in relationships. And another study actually correlated that higher adherence to the spread of HIV AIDS, a potentially fatal disease. Hegemonic masculinity is a pervasive issue, felt everywhere somehow. But if we look at it the right way, the right way it can be a beacon of hope. It shows us that masculinity can be fluid if we let it, and that we can discard the current ideal masculine male for another. From small things like no longer calling behaviors gay, to slightly bigger things like normalizing men wearing what they want to, we can change what it means to be the ideal male. And if we're feeling ambitious, we can discard that completely in favor of equal acceptance of people as they are. Disenfranchisement doesn't look a certain way and discrimination doesn't belong to a certain group of people. It's felt everywhere, somehow. Because of that, we need to look at gender equality in a different way. The difference between the privilege we see in people and the discrimination we don't is based on what we consider to be progressive. A century ago, women voting was progressive. Now, it's a right. Women's feminism has had multiple waves, but they haven't been successful thus far. So maybe what's needed is a change in mindset. And because of that, third wave feminism can be seen as something that didn't work. It was trying to build up a gender equality system while pointing to another and calling it toxic. But they didn't focus on the crux of the issue, asking why that system was toxic. And that's why the movement now needs to change to be successful. First, we need to deal with the toxic systems in society before we can try to build up ones that aren't. Which basically means that sometimes to raise true systems of gender equality, the old ones that were known to be flawed need to be raised. Thank you.